All right. Thanks for joining my channel again. Um, my wife pointed out to me a while ago, a long time ago, we've been married about 18 years, that I am a questioner, a challenger. I hate following rules. <laughs> um, so if you've been watching my channel at all, you'll probably agree with that, that I don't just follow the manufacturer's guidelines. I see what I can do based on what I want to create and try to push different products um, as far as I can. With resin, I there's no exception there either. I, um, I'm trying to do stuff that you're not supposed to do, big deep pours with uh, temperatures and thicknesses and that, um, that you probably shouldn't do. And I've been slowly correcting myself. I think the biggest lessons I've learned is that ambient temperature is absolutely critical, um, especially if you go to the, the warmer end. If it's too hot, your resin's going to set up really quickly and very hot at, at a hot temperature. The exothermic reaction goes crazy. So you get lots of bubbles. Any oil or water in the wood is going to boil. Um, so that's a problem. But I have discovered that on the colder end, the resin sets up really slow. And that allows for bubbles to rise and dissipate. And you get a really good product. So I've been putting my projects in a, a vacant uh, chest freezer that I leave open. I've got it at the warmest setting possible, and it keeps it around 30 or 40 degrees in the air temperature. But because I'm using <clears throat> a small tub full of sand that insulates it quite a lot, I, I can't speak to the temperature inside. But at least the surface of the resin is chilled quite a lot. And that has helped a lot of control that, the exothermic reaction if you can't get your hands on some of the more expensive, really long-setting resin. But even that stuff has to be at what they recommend, recommend a temperature, room temperature, or, or colder. Otherwise, you'll have the same violent exothermic reaction. So that's kind of one thing I've learned. The big lesson I learned on this project... Um, which made it look a whole lot different than what I was shooting for, was that the depth matters. Now, I've known that if you have really deep resin, it, it can get really hot, and that's a problem, and I had accounted for that. But what I didn't see coming was that it, it also reacts sooner, uh, quicker. And so my goal with this project was uh, to fill up the design with clear resin, let it get to the really thick gel state, and then come back and do some wavy flame-like patterns with a couple of different colors and have them cross. And it was, I had this image in my brain of this looking really cool and mixing where they crossed. Um, but to my, and I've done this exact resin, this is Total Boat stuff before and had great results. But the difference between that project and this one was that I made the, the pour much deeper because of my pattern on here to get it filled from end to end with a bit of a dip in the middle, the center turned out to be quite thick. So anyway, it set up way faster than I expected. And when I came back to it at about the time that it had worked out before, uh, it was already rock hard. And I could tell it had been a very hot reaction because it cracked and bubbled at certain places. And so one more lesson learned. <laughs> I was hoping I could chill it a lot and get away with a deeper pour, but for this specific type of resin, for the total boat um, uh, deep pour resin, I've I have found its limits. Um, I wouldn't exceed uh, an inch to two inches, as, as it suggests on the thing, even if you are cooling it way down. So, you know, I I I've, a lot of what I'm doing is for art and for charity, for to raise money for Operation Underground Railroad and help save kids from child sex trafficking. And, and that's been my thing for the last long time. But I also like experimenting. I like seeing what I can do with this stuff, see how far I can push it. Um, because uh, I have a problem with rules. <laughs> I should see a therapist. <clears throat> The other thing I'm doing, you'll notice, is I'm drawing out my designs and my plan 
just as a point of interest, I, I it's kind, you know, in science, you, you uh, keep lab notebooks and write down your findings and what happened so that you can refer back. Uh, I want to show my designs at the beginning so you can judge how close I got to what I was trying to do. And to keep myself honest, you know, I never want to sit back and go, wow, look at this cool thing I made when that really wasn't my plan. <laughs> I like, I like uh, happening upon stuff. I like discovering things by accident. And I'm totally fine appreciating the beauty of things that happen. Um, I think the most <clears throat> successful video I made was the crystal tree one. It's been seen almost 250,000 times. And to be honest, it was like the most disappointing outcome I've ever had. I, w I almost threw it in the garbage because it was so far from what I had planned. So I, I want to keep myself honest and, and show what I, how close I came to my original plan. Um, but I also like to experiment and, and discover things that I didn't plan and maybe incorporate that into the next design. All I know is when I step out in my garage and mess around with different things, you never know what's going to happen because I'm just winging it. All right, I'm really liking this process of <clears throat> wrapping my projects. These are decent sized vases and bowls. I'm wrapping it in this floor padding. I get it at Home Depot. It's super cheap for a huge roll of it. If you put the shiny side towards the project, it doesn't stick to the resin. And then I'm packing sand all the way around it so that I don't waste resin. Um, it fills up the, the, the odd spots, but the resin can still work its way around and fill up cracks and stabilize the wood. And packing it with sand very carefully all the way around, it really helps um, prevent waste. You know, you don't get resin in places you don't want it. I leave a lip of the foam up high enough so I can pour the, the resin as deep as I need to. Um, the other thing this has been useful for is, is leak prevention. Even if I've got a little sharp edge in my project that punctures a hole in the, in the foam, because it's packed with sand around it, it doesn't seem to go very far if it does leak. Uh, it kind of gums it up and stops the leak. So here's my bubbles and cracks. Clearly it was way too hot when it's set up. You'll see as I pull this out of here that it, you know, it's skin tight. Very little resin was wasted, but it does work its way around the whole thing and fills in cracks and defects that you might want to stabilize. So I'm going to stick with this for a while. I like it. I, um, if I could get a pressure pot big enough to put the whole thing in, I think I get the best of both worlds. But I am trying to manipulate it late into the resin setting stage, so you really can't do a pressure pot unless you stuck it in the very last second. Um, which I don't know how that would work when resin's at a gel state, which of course means I'll have another experiment to, to mess with <laughs> in the future. <laughs> so I got to this stage, and you, sometimes you can't tell what's deep in the resin when you do a deep pour, and I started realizing there was cracks all the way through the, the entire thickness of, of my design there and there were far more bubbles than I wanted and there's always a moment when things aren't going the way I want where I just about give up and I got really mad at this thing um, and, because it was so far from my original um, imagined appearance um, but I kept it anyway and I thought you know maybe we can fill the cracks with a different with, with a color give it some interest or just leave the cracks and have it look like uh, you know, cracked glass or something, and in the end I went for filling it with color. I kind of wish I could go back and not put any color in there and see how it would look with that, but, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty with these. As I mentioned before, my projects are always dedicated to supporting Operation Underground Railroad. Uh, these guys support operations all over the world to help free children from sex trafficking. Um, I know these two topics seem like strange bedfellows, but the, uh, the idea here is that I love making stuff. I love exercising my artistic side since I'm always in the clinic and surgery and doing things that are completely not artistic. <laughs> um, I always sell these projects over at Art for OUR. 
at artforour.org. Uh, and 100% of the money from my projects goes to Operation Underground Railroad. Uh, you can buy t-shirts. You can make donations directly. Um, there's treats you can buy over there. There's all kinds of stuff you can do, if nothing more than subscribing to this channel, liking videos, sharing them. All of that helps. All of that helps raise money. And uh, we just crossed the $20,000 mark for funds raised uh, since we started this project about 18 months ago. And I could not be happier with that. And, and just wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone who's made that possible. Um, for a dude messing around in the garage with a medium, he really doesn't know what he's doing. I am so happy with the, with the experience and the, the support and the positive stuff that comes my way. You guys are awesome. You make this completely possible. So I'll see you on the next project. Have a great day.